day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the University of Guam. This is the class lecture hall. My name is Arlene Steffi, and I am the chair of the seminar series. I would like to bring to your attention, too, that this is the 50th year of the Micronesian Area Research Center. And in that 50th year, <laughs> yes, we haven't performed miracles, but we have performed a lot. And in celebration of that, um, we have sponsors that we would like to first uh, bring some attention to. The Bank of Guam, Madsen, Madsen Inc., Midpac Guam, Choice Broadcasting, which is Boss 104.3, Star 101, and The Port. A point, I'm sorry, point. The MB Communication Services, Metro Pacific Manila, IP and E Guam, GHD Group, and Tango Theaters. And those are the sponsors who have contributed greatly to the support of a lot of the activities that are happening as a, in celebration of the 50th year of Mark. That is not to be confused with the honorarium sponsors that we will mention at the close of the presentation as we give uh, Larry um, our appreciation for being here. So welcome to the university on behalf of the president, Robert Underwood, who is present with us today, the uh, dean of class, uh, James Summon, and um, James Verdes, who is the Tomorrow Program Studies Coordinator and made it possible for us to use this lecture hall. And most especially to our director, Monique Story, at the Micronesian Area Research Center, who's also present with us. Our presenter for the fourth installment is Regatol. That is his name. Because of modern um, advent in the app, very similar to what it used to be on Guam, they only have one name. And I was speaking to Larry about this at a dinner that he and my husband and I had. And he said his name is only Regatol, and each of his brothers have their own unique names. And Larry has become his middle name. And he was named something else as a res out of respect of a friend of a parent of his. I'm not going to tell you all that. I want him to tell you all that. So would you please put your hands together and welcome our honored speaker tonight, Regatol from Yap. Thank you very much, Arlene, for the kind introduction. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Underwood, good to see you, good evening. And to everybody, I uh, welcome you to this evening's talk. I am very privileged to have the opportunity to be here uh, to share with you. Uh, I, of course, am uh, a bit nervous, so I'm going to do my best not to be. Uh, the reason I'm very nervous is that all my experiences of uh, public speaking, I have never had my daughter sit and watch me. Uh, but tonight, my daughter is here, and so I'm very nervous. Uh, I think I'm going to get some scolding afterward. Um, that said, if I, when I, before I uh, came up here, a good friend Cheryl. Uh, and I talked and she said, oh, we heard that you had uh, a good uh, uh, introduction uh, back at uh, UC Irvine a month ago. Um, so I said, I will do it just for you, Cheryl. Uh, and so tonight, if you, at the moment, if you could just excuse me, uh, I'd like to uh, properly dress uh, in the presence of all of you. Uh, and here I do it because of my ancestors for whom I speak and I stand and, and share their story. I'm not going to put on a show for you. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. But I will hide myself a little bit. This is my anointing cloth that was given to me by my late father, uh, given about a month before he died. And I'm always reminded every time that I go do this kind of talk to, to honor him. So I'm going to wear my 
my loincloth from him and also the, the attire that he gave me. Arlene also asked me to wire myself, so I wouldn't that. <laughs> This is her lady Rea of Marangan. <laughs> I'm always reminded when I wear this this attire that I'll tell you a story about it. I, I, he actually gave me a week before he died was my last Christmas gift from him. That was last year. And I went, I was struggling to, uh, to go to Australia to give a, a talk on ocean knowledge. But after he passed, I decided I would do it, I'd go. Well, when I got there, I realized that I was so unprepared. But I opened my luggage hours before my talk, and I had the attire he gave me as my Christmas present, so I wore it. And it was as if he was around, so makes a big difference and I think that was the reason why he gave me. MMI Gutch. It means it's very good. Um, am I okay now? Am I properly dressed, Bruce? Thank you. All right, so uh, this evening I hope to share with you my story and the story that it belongs to the young boys that I work with and it belongs to uh, the people of Lamatrek, the people of the outer islands of Yap, and of course our ancestors that are uh, that were here before us. I know, that, of course, the presence of uh, my cousins and relatives who are here. Um, so, with with due respect to them, so I a presentation AI. Uh, uh, of course, we found in Captain Marikin and Mugishi Masuda or Fadiri. I will start uh, with a very simple chant that I uh, learned from my late father and those before them. Very brief. I know, of course, that I'm given a certain amount of time to do this presentation. So here is the chant. I will explain to you what it is. I was a little I will shorten it because what that chant is refers to a voyage that took place somewhere and I'm told it was in Lama Trek. That voyage uh, came uh, to Lama Trek and somewhere in the big Pacific Ocean the canoe broke and there were women on board and child. I believe he was somewhere around nine years old, and he's also, uh, the child was from Woliai, and the mother, and Simon, and my cousin, is from there. But make the long story short, after all those guys that have been trained to repair canoes at sea, attempted their very best and failed, the nine-year-old swam over and did it for them. And so the mother composed the chant for him, for that child. And I like this chant because it, again, reminds me that I know very little. I have to respect the elders and I also respect the young because somewhere there, the child might be the lifesaver that I need. I started my journey uh, way back uh, to leave my island when I was 12, 13. 
I found myself uh, in California, eventually getting my undergraduate study, and then also to England to get my graduate study. I returned back to the government, uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, worked for, as a diplomat for some years, and then returned to YAP to work with that government for some years, and eventually found myself in the jungles of YAP, uh, working, carving canoes, and teaching young people uh, traditional skills. So I kind of think to myself that I'm either going backward or not too sure what I'm doing. But the only one sure thing I know is that of all these years that I've gone to get my degrees, I found out that I know very little and I'm still learning. I started, uh, co-founded a non-profit or a non-government organization known as WAGE. I will just pull up the site for that. So WAGE is, uh, we have a website thanks to technology. Uh, WAGE is an NGO that we started and our mission is to work with the young people uh, by pair pairing them up with the elders to do skills transfer. Whether it be in canoe carving, in navigation, in fish trap making, and all of these things. And why am I doing that? Well, I'll tell you why I'm doing it. When I was, my first trip to Yap was in the 70s. There were about at least 200, the most, maybe the most 200 of us Outer Island people there. And let me just also put Outer Island in context because I've heard the term, term Outer Island here in Guam referring to uh, people from the freely associated states. Uh, for the, the Plauans, they refer to the outer islands as the Southwest Islands. For Yap, the outer islands is from Uliti all the way out to Sarawal. Chuk, they have the Pafang, Patiu, and the upper and lower Mortlocks. And in Point Bay, they have the outer islands as Kapinga, uh, and Mokil, and Pingalap, Nukor. And then marshals, of course, uh, have the Ralik and Ratak chain of Outer Islands. So when I'm speaking of Outer Islands, I am speaking specifically for the Outer Islands of Yap, which is from Uliti out to Sarawal. So back 20 years ago, there were about two, 200 the most in Yap. And we go there only to for medical reasons, uh, then eventually working for the government. Today, fast track it to today, our number has increased substantially. And we are locating, at the same time, we're also increasing our number in Guam and Hawaii and the US. So there is obviously a movement of our people migrating in. And as I said, attributed to a lot of these things. But I know that in the not too distant future, we're gonna be faced with a bigger challenge to relocate. That's going to be climate change and sea level rise and all the impact that it comes with it. Wage, my mission or the, I, the concept that we wanted to do was to recreate an outer island living environment where the young people that are born and raised now in the center have an opportunity to see, if not to participate and appreciate and learn our indigenous uh, cultures and traditions, be it in canoe carving or navigation or uh, whatever else that we do. For the women, it's inclusive of weaving. And I will show you uh, a very quick PowerPoint presentation showing a bit of what we do. And then for the remaining part of my presentation, lecture would be to show you a 27 minute documentary film that was done last year when we did our voyage from Lamatrek to Guam for FESPAC, uh, of which I was very grateful to Dr. Underwood for doing a lot for us, including having to send uh, our pandana sail that we brought for the, for the festival uh, all around the world. It's gone to various places, and today we're now working with uh, Germany to figure out where it goes next 
but it was there for the recently concluded G20 summit in Hamburg. All right, so my, the title of my presentation is Seeking for Alternate Solutions. And essentially what that is, is that I'm, again, I just told you the basic story that there is movement of our people in. Our, as you know, our indigenous knowledge, some of them, if not all of them, are, were and are considered sacred knowledge. Whether it be navigation, canoe building, uh, Everything, you name it, is all sacred. Hence, the fact, the reason why we kept them within certain realm of the families and clans. But that's not happening anymore because a lot of our kids are going to school. And so, I am seeking that alternate solution to recreate a setting where the new generation, whether it be my child, my only child is here, so she will not, but the others are able to participate and to learn the skills. So I just mentioned the context of our terminology, Outer Island. We're referring to the Outer Island of the app where there is about 4,000 people there. Not anymore, that number is significantly decreased because what we used to have as 200 in Yap is no longer that number. We've escalated to over 1,000 not to mention those that have re relocated to Guam, Hawaii, and into the U.S. mainland. As most of you know, one of the things that we learn as navigators from our teachers, one of the very first things they teach you is that when you go off on a voyage, it is essential for you, before the island behind you disappear, to look back. The reason you look back is because that is going to give you how you get to your destination. You must know from which star the island of origin disappears in order for you to know how to set your course for the island of destination. In other words, there are currents, there are movements of, of the ocean, drift that must be calculated in. And if you don't look back and you don't know from where you came, that's losing the destiny number one. Is, is that you failed the test because you've, you've already lost it. I like this metaphor to kind of do it uh, related to what we do in general at Wage and the need for us to recreate this setting and allow the young people to look back to their origin. Sometimes I feel like I'm like the biggest hypocrite trying to tell these kids that it's important to know the traditional knowledge and, and skills. Because some of them looked at me and said, well, you've had your opportunity, you've, you've went abroad, and now you're coming back to teach. But that's no, that's beside the point. I want to make sure that they know from where they come in order for them to know where they're going. I think it helped me myself when I went to school, when I gave the commencement speech at the University of San Francisco, and for the first time, my friends and students at that school realized that I was the crocodile dundee of the class. And that I actually came from a primitive culture. I told them, yes, but we are not at all uncivilized. Because what I see in the culture that I was in was a little more uncivilized than the, than the culture that I grew up in. So while we may not have electricity, and while we may not have running water, and not worrying about getting up to do final exams, um, there is still a lot of cohesiveness, there is a lot of orderly in that community. And so I think the indigenous knowledge teaches a lot of the basic principles of what it is to be a human being. And that you must respect your elders, because one day you will get in their seat and those coming behind will learn it too. So this is the importance of the looking past, looking into the past to, to know your future. And further terminology for the outer island groups, we are known as the Remeto people, which is the people translated into people of the ocean. In Yap, we are also known as Pimtao or the Rafaluash. Or, uh, or the Rapagonoj, 
or the Rafanapi, all of which refers to some group of people that come from the ocean, the reefs, the drops, but that's us. This is the organization that I work, and some of you may remember. Happy time buckets are very useful for, for baskets. I've learned this, although the cover of mine wasn't tight enough when we voyaged back from Guam, I lost my laptop into the Marianas Trench. <laughs> These are the canoe houses that we work at, and so one of the things that we do is making ropes, teaching the young boys how to make ropes. We teach our boys how to make canoe houses, and this is important because if you think of our indigenous knowledge as separate by themselves, please understand they are part of one single system. At the pinnacle of that, you might become the navigator. But in order for you to become the navigator, you must have your float. Hence the need for you to know how to carve your canoe. But in order for you to know how to carve your canoe and be the navigator, you must also know how to take care of that canoe. And so Canoe House is our central learning facility where all starts from there. And this is where the knowledge is shared. So for us in, at Wage in Yap, it is the Canoe Houses that is central to what we do. And it's important for these boys to learn how to refurbish it, to redo it, and that's what we do. This was a post ceremony done by my cousin Ali in Yap and a cultural day where we showcase our food preparation for voyaging canoes. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a bit skip, uh, skimming through this because of time. I need to show you the documentation and allow for exchanges. Our canoes can go really fast too. They, they travel uh, top speed. You can get it up to seven, eight knots. Of course, beyond that, you're going to have to lower your sails and drift because the, the canoes are lashed. Anything beyond seven knots, you're putting a lot of stress on the canoes. And these are our future generations. We have school visits and we bring the kids to see what we do. The woven pandana sail, this was back in the 40s, so I just grabbed that photo. I've shared all these challenges with you and, and, and so again, that we are moving and we're seeking ways to participate. So what do we do? This is Wage. I've touched on who we are. We carve canoes by engaging elders with the younger people. We launched canoes last week. We just launched one canoe and initiated two new master carvers. Isaiah and Wilson were uh, being given, bestowed the title of Sinap, which is uh, Master Canoe Carvers. We, do, we teach boys how to sail our canoes. Our youngest apprentices uh, are at age five, and these boys are a little bit older. But what they're doing is uh, making the first process of rope making, which is to pull out the coconut husks that have been in the water for a couple of months, process to get the fiber, and so here we go with the local twine rope. Local hut making, that's uh, my nephew Audric there when he was about seven, and fish trap making are some of the things that we teach these young boys. Of course, as I said, weaving is also part of it. And so these are some of our weavers that are engaged in doing uh, weaving in Yap. So why do we do this? I think we do it because we have that responsibility passed on from our ancestors to ensure that the knowledge is also passed on to the younger generation. This knowledge doesn't belong to one individual, it belongs to the deities and it belongs to the land that we come from. Uh, we are, of course, a community at risk, as I said, of losing our culture, hence our identity, because of our movement. 
And we do it because we want to do it for a better future for us. So I'm grateful to the university for allowing me to come here and to share uh, this documentation with you. Uh, I know that uh, some of you have visited us and you've seen what we do. That said, I want to also say that you know we have our own challenges every day as we deal with this because the upstream, this is an upstream battle. Every younger generation wants to go off to school. I don't blame them, I want them to do that. I'm sending my daughter to the University of Guam. Uh, that's, that's their future, but at the same time, I think it's essential for them to know some of this uh, indigenous knowledge that has been passed on for generations. I'm Larry, and I work at the Canoe Houses in Colonia. We are from the organization WAGE, and our mission is to work with the young people to hopefully pass on some of the traditional skills that are at risk of being lost. Currently, we have a project with the women and men of Lamatrek Island to weave a traditional voyaging canoe sail from Pandanus Lead. Woven into the sail will be a message about climate change, which is starting to hit the community pretty hard. We then plan to voyage from Lamatrick to Guam in three canoes, and display the sail at Festpack. By showing people our bandana sail, hopefully we'll remind the world of the vulnerability of our island homes to the dangers of a changing climate. The journey for Larry and his crew begins with a boat trip from Yap to Lemon Trek Island, where they will pick up the woven sail and join the canoe fleet for its voyage to Guam. In the five days it takes them to get there, the island community has been busy getting the canoe fleet ready to sail. We're home. This is Lemon Trek. Hey, Queen. There will be three canoes going to Guam. The largest, more than 28 feet long, is Queen Veronica. Genesis is the smallest of the three canoes, just over 21 feet. The lucky star, she's about 25 feet long and built by one of my canoe carving teachers, Joe. About 300 people live on Lamatrek today, and like many of the Pacific Islands, it sits directly in the crosshairs of the world's changing climate. Super typhoons, super high and low tides, wave surges, sea level rise, are all threats to the island's ecosystem and unique way of life. <laughs> A big concern is that long before the island may disappear from a rising sea, its ecosystem will lose the ability to provide fresh water and food. For years now, the Federated States of Micronesia has considered climate change a serious threat to the island nation. 
It has used international environmental treaties like the Montreal Protocol for the protection of the ozone layer to help in the fight against global warming. Federated States of Micronesia diplomats have proactively lobbied for the accelerated phase-out of ozone and climate system harming revitrin chemicals like HCFCs. It is our survival that we come here at the Montreal Protocol to plead for, and we will not stop. I think we will continue, because what choice do we have? These heroic efforts of our Foreign Service people will hopefully help to delay the onset of a warming world with its faster rising seas. This will, of course, be an enormous help to the Lamotrek people. Oh, man, because we are 40 years. Sad. Well, I'm all a whole car. I want to kill it in the Lamuer. We all see my room, we call it the Kremlin, but it's the digital one. Four. Four. One of the first things that Larry and his crew does is check on the progress of the Pandanus sail. It has to be finished in the next 48 hours when the canoe fleet sails for Guam. They're just going to finish uh, sewing one more part. This part. You got a and then the wording will come up. So that's another. Uh, that's Xavier, by the way. Xavier has uh, been the one in charge of getting the sail done. Now it takes both women and men to make a traditional sail. The work is almost evenly split. The women harvest the pandanus leaves, dry them, slice them into strips, and weave them into a special type of mat. The men then take these mats and stitch them together with coconut fiber rope to actually make the sail. But wait a second, making the sail was not that easy. There was a big problem at the start of the project that no one anticipated. After agreeing to do it, the community quickly discovered that the knowledge of how to weave a sail with pandanus leaf wasn't there anymore, or so they thought. Uh, the community realized what a miracle it was they caught Maria almost at the very last moment. Once she taught the weavers what to do, it then took about 50 women, almost two weeks working full-time to weave the material for the sale. Next came the climate change message, some expression from the community about what a change in climate meant to them. In the center, we have the word and it translates into survival of the Glory with a big, huge question mark. Once everybody agreed on the message, the entire community signed the sale, giving their stamp of approval. I wonder if you just sign on this sale somewhere. Confident their traditions will survive and resonate with the outside world. The day before the departure for Guam, the canoes are launched into the lagoon. For the voyagers, there is still much to do to get ready for the journey. Water and food are critical. The 500-mile trip to Guam should take between four and eight days, depending on weather. But the canoes have to carry enough supplies for at least two weeks, just in case.
The next morning, the entire island rises early and gathers at the beach for the departure ceremony. Άρα θα σου μόσου έτο. Εγώ να σου πω ότι σε αυτή τη μετάφραση και τι κάνω. Εγώ να εμβολβε αγρίδι γριαρμέτ. Ρερφαριού. Μεγράει. Ρερφαριού. 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 Ρε The first order of business is for Ali, the captain of the Queen Veronica, to purify himself, and then to be officially empowered as the lead or ghost navigator, responsible for the safety, welfare, and setting the course of the three-canoe fleet. <laughs> Ali then invites all the voyagers to sit in a protection circle to receive their own blessings and empowerment. Ali then walks the circle with a smudging torch, purifying the group. <laughs> Finally, he cuts the circle, effectively cutting away the fears, doubts, and insecurities the voyagers may have, leaving this baggage, as it were, all behind them on shore. With the completion of the final blessing, the voyagers are ready to begin their journey. The community quickly surrounds them to say their last-minute goodbyes. With one final blowing of the conch, the departure ceremony is done and the journey begins. So we just left the uh, Lama Trek with uh, the rest of the crew on uh, Lucky Star. There's a total of nine of us We're heading up to Guam. Uh, we hope to be there uh, in four or five days, weather permits. With the canoes finally underway, traditional wayfinding, or navigation, now comes into play. In traditional navigation, our ancestors have basically broken up the sky, if you will, into their own compass, if you like, using the stars. And actually, it does coordinate very well with the modern technology in terms of the actual compass. We use other elements in traditional navigation to find our destination, including sea waves, even uh, fish and, and birds out in the ocean that have been identified by our ancestors or as uh, guidance for us. So whenever we see them, uh, then we can reference where we're heading or our course. One of the first navigation actions the voyagers do, logically, is set a course. How do we know where we're going, boys? Terrifus. The boys are already set on the chart, which is the course of 350, 000 true north, so we're moving a little bit uh, to the west of uh, true north. Traditionally, 
Over hundreds of years, the Lama Trek to Guam sea lane has been well traveled. It's a straight shot, really. If you stand on the beach in Lama Trek and find Polaris, the North Star, the island of Guam would be about 10 degrees to the west at a 0350 heading. Technically, it's not hard to miss if you sail towards it. The tricky part, however, is the wind and the currents. And it's about 500 miles of open water. After leaving the relative calm of Lemon Trek's lagoon, the fleet moves into voyaging position, with Ali and Queen Veronica taking the lead, the Genesis in the middle, and the Lucky Star bringing up the rear. It's been a long and tiring first day, and as the watch settles in for the night, crew members grab space on deck where they can to get some much needed rest. Day two at sea dawns another great sailing day, perfect for the crossing to Guam. Later that afternoon, however, the perfect sailing weather begins to turn. The canoe heads into a storm front, rolling in from the east. As it picks up, the crew reefs in the sail to make it a smaller target against the wind and rain. As late afternoon turns into night, the weather gets really ugly. The wind and waves surge, the stress on the hull increases, and Lucky Star's seams begin to leak. The crew does its best to patch the hulls and keeps bailing. During the night, Lucky Star is forced to lower her sail. We were adrift at the mercy of the elements not knowing whether we could be run over by any passing vessel, because it was complete darkness. Finally, dawn could not come soon enough for the voyagers. The rain has stopped, but the wind and waves are still high. The conch is blown to signal the other canoes, who also lowered their sails during the night. Eventually, they signal back that they are safe. In morning's light, it's clear the storm has damaged Lucky Star's hull. The crew quickly patches the holes with softwood plugs, and the crew member is permanently assigned to the bilge with a bucket to constantly bail. Soon, good weather returns, and the voyage continues. This is our fourth day to our journey. We are still estimating that we are somewhere roughly 100 miles or so away from Guam. We expect to maybe start spotting Guam tonight. This has been a great journey so far, but we are still not there. And in our usual traditional practice, when you're not there yet, you still have to expect the worst. For Larry and the crew, the worst does not happen, but something pretty challenging does. As the Lucky Star approaches the southern tip of Guam, the speed and the direction of the current changes. It switches from an easterly flowing direction to one heading southwest. It feels like the Lucky Star is just flying along towards Guam, but in reality, She's being swept out to sea. Finally, realizing they're getting nowhere, the crew decides to change course to try and break out of the current. But coming about or tacking with a voyaging canoe is not an easy task. It's physically demanding and dangerous. It means on stepping the sail frame and moving it to the opposite end of the canoe, where the rudder is. Okay. 
The rudder, in turn, is then moved to the sail's former position. So what was the stern now becomes the bow. All day and into the evening, the crew tacks back and forth, again and again. moving the sail and the rudder. Finally, in the early hours of the morning, the wind gives out, depriving Lucky Star of any forward motion. Exhausted, the only thing the voyagers can do is pull down the sail and let the current take them out to sea. We are waiting for Genesis, and then we together will go into Guam. About a half hour later, Genesis is spotted, but she's not alone. The Independence, a Federated States of Micronesia patrol boat, has her in tow. Good, 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 good. Genesis had called for help. During the storm, she cracked one of the beams supporting her main platform. In the morning, they made repairs as best they could, but she was proving hard to handle in the strong southern current, so her captain called for a tow. The Lucky Star hitches a ride, too, and both canoes are soon under tow. Three hours later, the voyagers are close enough to Guam to receive a police boat escort. Finally, nearing shore, the Independence drops her tow line. The Lucky Star hoists her sail and sails into the harbor to a hero's welcome. The sun isn't up yet, and the entire harbor is alive with preparations for opening day of the festival. Queen Veronica, Genesis, and Lucky Star paddle their way past the gathering crowds who've come to honor the voyagers. Lucky Star is outfitted with the Pandanus sail, and all day yesterday, the crew practiced sailing her with this woven masterpiece. Though none of the crew has ever worked with the woven sail before, we are pretty confident we know what we're doing. When mounted on the Lucky Star, it's obvious that the sail's weight is significant, maybe 10 times that of a Tecron sail. The crew practices tacking, swinging its massive weight about and it seems like it's nothing they can't handle. Once outside the harbor, the Lucky Star and the other voyaging canoes wait for the sun to rise and the parade to begin. Suddenly, tragedy strikes a neighboring canoe from Palau. A crew member is rushed to the hospital and dies upon arrival. The fallen seafarer is a sober reminder of why Lama Trek's departure ceremony is more than just a quaint tradition. Ceremony is a powerful affirmation of the sanctity of life and the sanctity of an island's community in the face of an ever-changing world. Thank you. 
special sale and we found that the art and the skills of weaving a bandana sail had almost ceased but today I'm very happy that the women of Lama Trek they worked very hard to make sure that the skills of bandana sail is uh, carried on if you look up in the center we have the word and it translates into survival of Lamuiduk's glory with a big, huge question mark. And the reason we have it as a question mark is because we're very uncertain where our future is gonna be. I think a lot of changes are taking place, but the biggest threat for us is that of climate change and all that it brings along with it. The Federated States of Micronesia is fighting global warming on a number of fronts. On the international level, it continues to work with other nations through the Montreal Protocol to reduce ozone and climate-harming chemicals. It had a big success recently with the adoption of the Kigali Amendment, where almost 200 countries agreed to phase out HFCs and potentially avoid up to half a degree centigrade of global warming by the end of the century. On the community front, FSM continues to promote the use of traditional skills and knowledge, like canoe building, sail weaving, and wayfinding navigation. If there is anything that our ancestors taught us, it is that these technologies might indeed be our lifesavers. I say this because someday, should the need arise to seek to higher land, these canoes might just be the means for us to get from our low-lying islands to the higher mountains and save our culture. documentary film. Uh, it hasn't been produced, so we're still working on that, and I'm hopeful that with some good friends in the crowd, we will find some way to, to produce it. Uh, but the lady who taught the knowledge of uh, sail weaving died two weeks after she passed that knowledge on. She never saw the final product. But thanks to the university, Dr. Underwood, that sale went from UOG to Hawaii. It was also uh, featured at the UN conference, Ocean Conference, back in July uh, and then, or June, and then it went over to Hamburg for the G20 summit. So yes, while some people may say uh, climate change is the Chinese hoax, uh, it surely isn't for us. It's real, it's happening, and we've seen it. And my good friend uh, Bruce knows it. He's seen his islands disappear before our eyes. Uh, but this is part of the story that I'm telling for the young kids that work with me uh, for their future. Uh, and I, I tell it on behalf of our ancestors that have been here before us. I was going to, uh, some of you may have thought of me maybe giving a more presentation on the process of canoe building or navigation. I will do it justice to those if I squeeze it into this limited time. That said, I'm, I'm fortunate that uh, I'm working closely with the university, uh, the Sea Grant and our Center for Island Sustainable Development. Hopefully in the near future we'll 
will uh, put on something more uh, thorough, more detailed in those areas of indigenous knowledge, whether it be navigation or canoe building. Uh, I look forward to that opportunity, but uh, we'll keep you informed. Let's put our hands together and thank you. Okay. You okay? I don't know. Did you do okay, Ria? What do you think? I was going to give her the microphone. She's like, oh. Okay, well, we have something to present you with. And this is a binder of all the press releases that Thank announced you. your coming um, in the newspaper. The Post gave you really good coverage. And it also contains an envelope that only